Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jessica. I'm with the Chelmsford Library. Um, and uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We're just letting people kind of roll in here. Um, but thank you for joining us on this sunny Sunday. Um, the, I do have a couple of program announcements to make, if you'll bear with me for just a second. Um, we have a bunch of programs coming up just this week, actually. On Monday, we have a virtual author affair event with uh, Alifair Burke. She's going to discuss her new book, Find Me, and she'll be in conversation with Hank Philippi Ryan. That's virtual. You can sign up on our calendar. On Wednesday, we have another art-related um, <laughs> program, Uncovering a Lost Rodin Masterpiece. And it's Mallory Mortellaro is the curator of collections for the Hartley Dodge Foundation. She's going to tell the story about how she uncovered during her, in her work a lost um, Rodin sculpture. So that's going to be that's going to be pretty interesting. And that's on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, and then on Thursday, we welcome back Dr. Steve Hale of the University of New Hampshire. He's going to talk to us about winter backyard birds. Um, and he'll go through a bunch of different um, types of birds and how to identify them from your own window. Um, also, just want to let everyone know we are set up for a whole new series of uh, events with um, Jane O'Neill. And uh, the next one is going to be on February, Tuesday, February 22nd. And that's going to be with Faith Ringgold, Quilts, Painting, and Politics. Uh, so that should be really interesting. Um, but today, uh, we will, we have a very special Sunday um, afternoon. Um, actually, when Jane O'Neill first came to uh, uh, came to present with for the Chelmsford Library when we were doing it in person, um, she used to come on Sunday afternoons, and it was it was a really nice kind of break. Um, and so she's back today. Um, if you have not attended one of these events before, uh, Jane holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She's a New Hampshire native and has worked with some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she serves as executive director, and the Courier, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the Museum of the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Zimmerman House. She's taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Uh, her organization is called Culturally Curious. Culturally Curious's mission is to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Today, she's going to present Paul Gauguin in Tahiti. So this will be a great, a great presentation to escape the cold with. Um, escape to the South Pacific with the vibrant colors of post-impressionist painter Paul Gauguin. Uh, learn about Gauguin, the infamous frenemy of Vincent van Gogh, van Gogh, I'm sorry, and his career in France and his decision to leave it all behind. Enjoy the incredible images inspired by the Tahitian people than the landscape and find out why success eluded this notorious artist during his lifetime. If you have any questions for Jane during the presentation, please direct those to the chat or use the Q&A module and we will ask them after the presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jane. Thank you so much, Jess, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about art and think about art. This is like such a, it's like a refresher for our brains, it's like a palate cleanser for our brains. So um, it's a delight for me to be able to share this material with you. And when I was putting this program together several months ago, I was definitely thinking about escaping from the cold this January and um, and going to Tahiti sounded really nice to me. And I, little did I know we'd all wanna be escaping from COVID and um, <laughs> in addition to just going someplace warm. But as I was putting the material together, I also really found out that um, that for Paul Gauguin, this notion of escape uh, was a multifaceted one. It was an escape from, from civilization, but also uh, from possible misdeeds we'll learn about today. So Paul Gauguin is certainly one of art history's most celebrated painters from the late 19th century. And what we'll do today is learn more about his notorious life and his very distinctive artwork. We will be getting back to this gorgeous image on the screen uh, about at about the middle of the presentation. <clears throat> 
So let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll move through the material. We'll get started with an introduction to the artist, really everything leading everything in his life leaning up to his, the start of his career as a painter. And so appropriately, I put a self-portrait over here that's called Bonjour Monsieur Gauguin, where we see him walking around with like the classic artist beret over here. And then he's an artist that's sort of defined by his wanderlust. He moved around quite a bit during his lifetime. And so we'll we'll look at his work in um, in pont Aven, which is a part of Brittany, France. And then we'll move to the south of France, where he spent time with Vincent van Gogh. And then we'll look at the work that was inspired by his time in Tahiti and the South Pacific. The interlude there is when he goes back to Paris, and we'll see what happens while he's there, too. So um, needless to say, he's, he's a man who could get into a lot of trouble. Let's see how it all began for Paul Gauguin in our introduction. So we see him here in these handsome photographs. He's about 25 years old in both of them. He was born in the uh, momentous year of 1848. And if you're familiar with European history, there was a lot going on in Europe that year, but there was also a revolution in France. And for safety's sake, uh, when he was about 18 months old, his family decided to set sail for Peru. You could almost imagine that that's where the, the wanderlust began for him. Uh, Unfortunately, his father died on that journey. And so he lived there with his mother and his sister for um, the next five years, but then ultimately they returned back to France. He had a boarding school education where he learned Catholic liturgy. We'll see a lot of um, uh, religious iconography sneaking into his artwork. You might have already noticed some in the images that I've shared today. He also studied fencing. He became a master fencer as a young man, but incidentally, he never studied art. So after school, he went on to join the Merchant Marines and uh, then the Navy. He was sailing around the world. He was actually in India when he found out that his mother had passed away as well. So, um, so when he returned, he uh, uh, was then taken on, his care was taken on by an appointed guardian. And that guardian was really the person who started to influence Gauguin in terms of uh, an interest in art. He, he, this guardian, was an art collector and particularly loved art from the middle of the 1900s, realist art, art uh, that showed peasants working and middle-class people uh, it, doing leisure time activities. These are both works by um, the artist Courbet, the wheat sifters over here and young ladies on the banks of the Seine. And I think these kinds of images sort of ignited an interest in Paul Gauguin. And we'll see maybe too how they might have influenced later work. Now this guardian who introduces him to art also introduced Paul Gauguin to his wife. Here is um, a, a very early self-portrait by Paul Gauguin from the early um, 1870s, right around the time that he uh, met his wife. And this is also a portrait that he did of her from, from this time period as well. So he married this woman named uh, Mette Sophie Gatt. She was a Danish woman. They only knew each other for about a year before they got married. And during that year, they only spent about four months time with each other. I'm sort of setting you up for the expectation right now that maybe things aren't um, so peachy in their relationship. This is a photograph of the two of them together. Um, and I, I always love to read body language and photographs and, and you don't see a lot of closeness or affection here in this photograph. Uh, this is from a little bit later on into their marriage. Uh, next to it is, a, is a, a still life painting by Paul Gauguin. He, as, he's, uh, as his interest in the arts is sort of blossoming, uh, so is his talent. He's spending more time painting, but he's really um, making a killing in the art market. He's working as a stockbroker. He's like a completely um, successful middle-class gentleman. He's making the equivalent of about $150,000 a year as a stockbroker. And then his work in, um, in as, as a, like an art trader and art maker yields him about another $150,000 a year. So he's doing really well in terms of his, his work. Um, now, 
Uh, let's turn our attention to this still life painting because a lot has been uh, said about this particular still life. It's oftentimes read as a portrait of him and his wife based on a fable of a clay pot and an iron jug that were traveling together. And the clay pot couldn't withstand sort of the, um, the tempest of the journey. And so it breaks, uh, ultimately showing that they are, they are ill matched for each other. This particular painting, which is at the Chicago Art Institute is actually of a wood tanker and a metal pitcher, but it's oftentimes read to be that same fable there, uh, mismatched lovers in any case. So um, in the course of about 10 years, the, the um, Gauguin and his wife do have five children. So, so there's a lot to stick together for during this time period, but a lot of tumult, like I said. One of his sons grew up to write about the fact that he saw um, his father physically abusing his mother. So it was not, um, it was not an easy life that they shared in, in this home. And then um, the stock market crashes and, and the family is sort of sent into financial ruin. So they ultimately leave Paris where they were living and move to Copenhagen, move to Denmark, and they're living with, um, with Paul Gauguin's wife's family. And Paul Gauguin attempts to become a salesman. He doesn't know the language. He fails at that. And so he decides to commit himself, devote himself full time to painting, something that he had just been sort of dabbling in before. And I think of this of this particular image as having so much influence or, or showing this, this incredible um, transition in his life. So what we see here in this self-portrait um, from 1885 is Paul Gauguin in his wife's family's attic, uh, painting himself as a, a young aspiring artist. And you sort of get this sense of, of the cramped quarters, how cold it was there. He's wearing this heavy jacket too, but his face is sort of turned to the window, turned to the light as though he's seeking inspiration or perhaps seeking escape. It's like already this, this big theme is coming into play here. He, um, he already had a, an artistic circle that he kept in touch with, including the Impressionist artist Pissarro. And he wrote to Pissarro that every day he thought about going to this attic and putting a rope around his neck, but it was only painting that held him back. And I would say this is a stunning painting. I, I Every time I look at it, I appreciate new elements of it. I love sort of the energy of the brush strokes here, um, the, the use of color, these the, the little reds and oranges that sneak in throughout just provide so much visual interest. The, the, um, the little uh, specks of yellow on the side of his face too. So I, I see something promising here. Here. And I can almost understand how, how this is the point where he decides that, that it's art for him. But that meant leaving his family. It meant going back to Paris, abandoning everything. And as he does this, we see in his self-portraits that he begins to change. Not only his artwork and his color palette and his brushstrokes, everything begins to change about Paul Gauguin. And he oftentimes reveals how he's thinking about himself in these self-portraits. Imagine laying in all that green paint on your face. <laughs> this is a painting from 1888, 1889. Um, so at this point, he is back in, in Paris, he's connecting with everybody in the art world, like everybody you can imagine. If you read about his life, it is just peppered with references to art dealers, to other artists. He seems to be someone who is adept at making connections, but he also had sort of a pugilistic personality. He could get into fights with anyone. One of his biographers framed it this way. She said something uh, uh, to paraphrase. He was basically almost always in a duel, almost all the time. He, was, he, he would fight with everybody so he could make the connections, but then break the connections. In fact, um, his ability to alienate people was perhaps best described by his own mother. When he returned home from India after learning of her death, he went through papers, her papers, and he found something that she wrote that said, uh, he, as in Paul Gauguin, has made himself so unliked that he will one day find himself all alone. We'll see if that comes to fruition. So the last image I wanted to use 
to introduce you to the artist is one where we see his full evolution into a bohemian. He's grown out his hair. He's rocking polka dots and stripes. He's looking out at us with this kind of philosophical, quizzical gaze here. He's showing us this interest in, um, in non-Western art with the sculpture uh, in, in the back here. And then this sort of uh, interesting sort of a uh, flat patch of yellow paint just behind him, which I'm assuming is the back of his chair. He looks like a completely different person here. And he's trying to tell us that by this point, 1893, he's become a loner. He's cultivating the look of a loner too, an outsider. He's someone that really uh, hates what he thinks of as the corruption of Parisian society. And so doesn't it make sense that somebody who feels this way is looking to get out of town? So Paul Gauguin does just that. Um, and so let's take a look at what happens when he goes to Brittany, France. Pont Avant, something truly astounding happen happens in his artwork, and I've called it liberating color. All right, so just to get you situated in space, we've got Paris where he's been living, and then here is Brittany on the west coast of France and the small town of Pont Avant. Now, uh, Pont Avant was sort of like a traditional religious community where um, we're women and girls would wear these kind of old fashioned bonnets. It's almost like living in America and saying, uh, and, and deciding you want to go live with like the Mennonites or, or the Amish in some level. Uh, for for uh, Gauguin, this was like following enlightenment thinking, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, getting back to the natural man, uh, people that are connected with history and with religion and are uncorrupted by society. So this is his painting of Breton women dancing or Breton girls dancing from 1888. Um, this is a pretty straightforward composition that, that is honoring um, their traditional dances here, suggesting their piety. This is in the collection of the National Gallery of Art, incidentally. But other things begin to happen during this time in pont de -Vent, this, with this very religious sect here. And he creates this um, incredibly important work called Yellow Christ from 1889. This is at the Albright, Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo. It's kind of impressive how many Paul Gauguin works that, that are out there in Buffalo. So what are we looking at here? Well, let's get back to that idea of liberating color because Paul Gauguin is creating a scene here, a, sort of like a, recognize, a recognizable scene, something that seems you know, loosely based on observation, but the colors are not naturalistic, particularly, obviously, Jesus's skin here. Um, it's as golden as the as the fields surrounding him. And so, um, so what Paul Gauguin here is doing is like, he's flying in the face of hundreds of years of art artistic tradition, basically ever since the Renaissance, you have artists who are trying to describe what they see in the natural world and make pictures that look like windows onto another world. Even with the revolution of Impressionism, here's a Claude Monet still life of, um, of, of, of some flowers over here on the left. Even with the revolution of Impressionism, you still get the sense that artists are looking very closely at their subject matter and trying to capture an impression of it um, in a new way. Paul Gauguin was doing something else. He was doing something that was almost visionary. He was capturing more or less an idea of something because when we look at the subject matter of Yellow Christ, this is something that he could not have observed. We're looking at a depiction of the crucifixion as though it was set in modern times so that these Breton women are surrounding him on their knees in prayer as though, uh, as though they recognize that they're witnessing uh, the death of Jesus right in front of them. So, uh, so it seems as though he's like collapsing time here. He's um, barely using shadow. We see a little bit on Christ's body and in, and in the bonnets and the clothes of the women, but the rest of this is like flat patches of color. So there's a lot here that seems pretty revolutionary. Jesus's body also doesn't really look, um, look as though it's based on observation, but art historians have actually tracked down 
the the crucifix in the local church there uh and and you can see that he probably based that portrait on on the crucifix that that he was able to to observe from from real life uh some people think that they that he has used his own likeness here it, for the face of christ the yellow wheat fields um function great sy symbolically because we think about the crucifixion we think about the harvest um we think about cutting something down as opposed to uh uh, um, the resurrection, which is associated with springtime and life and renewal and growth and that sort of thing. So the yellow, the yellow color functions especially well here in a, in a symbolic sense too. Now, I think Paul Gauguin really understood just how important and revolutionary this picture was because in 1889 and 1890, he creates this self-portrait. Some people think of it as like a, a triple self-portrait where we see a pretty straightforward uh, portrayal of him himself. We don't see really any of the green patches on his face that we saw before. I mean, this almost looks like a, a contemporary man to, to our times. But it, it, behind him, he's included the yellow Christ flipped, of course, because he's looking at himself in a mirror. And then over here, over um, his other shoulder, there is this ceramic with this kind of grotesque face on it. And it's uh, understood that Paul Gauguin made that ceramic as well. So if you think of this as a triple self-portrait, he is kind of framing himself as both a saint or a martyr and a sinner or a demon, like all, all of these aspects of his personality are coming out um, sort, of, <laughs> sort of out of the edges of the picture here when he himself is presented as um, a straightforward, uh, a respectable young man. Now, one other really important picture that he created while he was in Pontivon is this one here, which again is really about liberating color. And so take a look at all of this red space in this picture. Nobody was really painting like this before Paul Gauguin. I think to some degree we've gotten accustomed to it. Uh, we're, we've been um, acclimated to this sort of imagery through you know, modernism in the 20th century. But before Paul Gauguin, people weren't just painting broad patterns patches of, of, um, of, of color in, in this way, especially when you have figures in storytelling, religious subject matter in this case, uh, to share as well. So in this case, we're looking at a picture from 1888, and it's called Vision After the Sermon or Jacob Wrestling the Angel. This is at the Scottish National Gallery. So we have this religious scene over here, which I should mention artists have been depicting throughout the history of time. This is Rembrandt's depiction of Jacob wrestling the angel, um, but but he sets it on this red ground that seems to suggest that it's otherworldly, that it's divine. And Paul Gauguin bisects the can the the canvas on this diagonal with this tree trunk, and on the other side we see all of these Breton women on their knees praying as they share this vision of something that no doubt they just learned about in in a sermon here. So um, so the use of that tree trunk was probably inspired by uh, Japanese woodblock prints because they. They were incredibly popular in um, in Paris and in, in French art, well, as, a, as an inspiration to French artists at this time. So, so using sort of like the silhouette technique to, um, to divide your canvas this way. So we see um, some uh, typical sort of influences, but really sort of innovative thinking coming from Paul Gauguin here. Now, what happens next? He goes and he, um, he begins to do some work with his best frenemy, Vincent van Gogh. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time, a little bit of extra time, I would say, on this, because I think it has um, a huge impact on um, him, his life, his work in Tahiti, et cetera. So from, I, I should say from Pontivon, uh, Gauguin actually goes and travels to Martinique and he creates some paintings based on his experiences there. When he returns uh, back to Paris with his paintings from Martinique, he, um, he brings these paintings, and and the brothers go get or the brothers Van Gogh, I should say, uh, see them and they love them. They actually bought this painting from Paul Gauguin. They didn't all really know each other, but uh, but this was the point at which they really connect. So we know Vincent Van Gogh, and sorry, I'm using the horrible American pronunciation of Van Gogh. He had a brother named Theo who was uh, an art dealer, and so Theo was really interested in selling Gauguin 
Gauguin's work. And in many ways, his Martinique pictures are very similar to his Breton women pictures. He imagined that the people of Martinique were sort of closer to nature, lived more simple lives. And so he wanted to describe uh, their lives working. I mean, think back to those uh, uh, um, realist works that he was first exposed to, really. So, um, so the brothers Van Gogh decide they want to make this proposal to Gauguin to go down to Arles, to the south of France, and work uh, with Vincent Van Gogh to sort of start this artist colony. Um, and this wasn't exactly a, a great <laughs> proposal because Vincent Van Gogh was not viewed as like a completely stable person at this time. So his brother had to really convince Paul Gauguin to go on this journey. He um, paid in advance for several works uh, by Gauguin, and then he also paid for his travel. So from there, we have um, Paul Gauguin going down to Arles to essentially start this artist colony with Vincent Van Go. Here is what Paul Gauguin looked like at this point in his career. Uh, and these two artists sort of shared this vision of like the city being corrupt. So why not, you know, commune together in nature and, um, and perhaps start a larger art artist colony there. Now they'll spend about 63 days together, nine weeks, and it's very tumultuous time. Um, and during this collaboration, or I, I, mean, I mean, this collaboration comes about, I should say, as um, as sort of like a shotgun marriage <laughs> between the two artists. It wasn't necessarily a romance, at least from Paul Gauguin's uh, perspective. And that was the way at least one art historian uh, named Hollis Clayson framed it. So so Gauguin was, was kind of pushed into this. So in advance of the artists meeting each other, they painted self-portraits and exchanged them to sort of introduce each themselves anew. Uh, and I'll really just focus on Paul Gauguin's self-portrait that he created for Vincent van Gogh. Um, he once again uses the strong diagonal to kind of cut his picture in half. And he shows himself with his um, face sort of turned to the side, um, pointing down his shoulder like this with a really sort of sinister, serious expression. And then he further ties um, this identity that he's trying to convey here to um, the book Les Miserables by Hugo, and um, particularly to the character Jean Valjean. Um, so there's this idea of sort of criminality here as well. It was so dark, but also so invigorating to, to Vincent Van Gogh. He wrote to his brother about it uh, several times. He, he provides, I think, a little bit of relief from the sinister visage he has painted here with the yellow wallpaper and the flowers behind it. It seems almost, uh, well, totally in incongruous when you think about it. This is a portrait of a third artist that was to be um, included but did not uh, um, join uh, Van Gogh and Gauguin in Arles. This is, of course, Vincent's self-portrait for um, this exchange. It's at the Harvard Art Museum, so you can see it for yourself. And interestingly, uh, Vincent Van Gogh originally included an inscription uh, for uh, Mon Ami, um, for, for my friend, Paul Gauguin, which was later painted out. And, and Harvard has some interesting um, research, has done interesting research on who in fact painted it out. And we don't know for sure, but we do know that it was in the possession of Paul Gauguin and then he ultimately sold it for a couple hundred francs. So I think it's pretty likely that Paul Gauguin painted out the inscription uh, from Vincent van Gogh. Now the two artists uh, unite in Arles in the south of France in the little yellow house that you see Vincent van Gogh has painted over here. This is van Gogh's uh, uh, essentially his portrait of his bedroom, showing that they had a pretty monastic lifestyle while they were living together. There's um, there, there wasn't a lot of distraction from painting, let's just put it this way. And on the other side of this door was where Paul Gauguin would be staying. It was a very productive time for the two artists. Um, during these uh, nine weeks, Van Gogh made 36 canvases and Paul Gauguin completed 21. And it's really interesting to sort of see them side by side. So we've got a Van Gogh uh, 
uh, portrait of sunflowers over here on the left. This is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And of course, he created multiple renditions of the sunflowers. And then we have Paul Gauguin painting Vincent van Gogh painting the sunflowers. Uh, van Gogh really didn't like this portrait of himself. He, he thought that Gauguin made him look like a madman and perhaps Gauguin thought he was a bad man during this time, but there's a lot of a um, lot of sort of typical Gauguin elements here. Just look at these broad patches of flat um, yellow and and green paint here in the background. Um, it's it's the same elements that we saw come out in Pontavon. Uh, Van Gogh also painted Gauguin at work painting. This is a, a tiny little piece, uh, and I just find it so fascinating. It's it's Gauguin's sort of distinctive profile here. The artist's beret. I love all the texture on the back of the vest and art historians have even identified which work um, Gauguin is, is actively painting here. Uh, Vincent van Gogh really admired Paul Gauguin and really thought of him as like the leader in their twosome here. I mean, this wasn't like a full-blown artist colony. It was just the two of them. But he thought Gauguin had sort of more to offer, more to teach. And so he created these portraits of chairs, which are really portraits of both of these artists. This would be Paul Gauguin over here, sort of a sturdier, more ornate chair over here. Vincent van Gogh's chair is this humble wooden chair with the with the straw um, seating over here. Uh, you can think of this candle for on Gauguin's seat as sort of like that spark of inspiration. He's the leader here. He's doing things that are igniting um, or inspiring uh, uh, Vincent van Gogh over here, who's got the pipe and um, and I think it's like a, a little sort of uh, cloth with, with tobacco here crumpled up on, on his chair. And then of course, the final and probably most obvious reading here is the Freudian one <laughs> where, uh, where we have essentially a phallus in, um, in Gauguin's seat and, um, and nothing as mighty over here in, um, in Vincent van Gogh's seat. Apparently these two artists would frequent the brothels and um, Vincent van Gogh wrote to his brother that uh, Paul Gauguin got more for his franc than, um, <laughs> than Vincent van Gogh did. So he admired him in that sense as well. Um, all right, so these two artists, and I'm just gonna switch to this comparison here, uh, would oftentimes paint the same subjects, even if they weren't sitting right next to each other. Uh, we're probably all familiar with uh, Van Gogh's famous painting, The Night Cafe from 1888. This is down at the Yale University Art Gallery. The acidic colors here, um, this depiction of a scene that's taking place after midnight with all of these solitary figures hunched over their drinks. Um, and then this, this one, lone figure in white who stares out at us, the viewer, from across the room, there's this real sense of um, alienation and foreboding with this picture. Um, and even like this room itself is kind of moving. I always get the sense that that pool table could just get up and kind of walk right out of the picture. <laughs> it's, it's a really sort of unnerving picture in so many ways. And we can see that Gauguin's portrayal of it is a little bit more straight forward that so we don't have these exaggerations of perspective the pool table looks like one like a regulation table that you could play a game on um, and in the background here sure you have a few sleepy drunks but you also have people socializing this man in particular we know is talking to a few prostitutes at his table and then it almost makes you he Gauguin almost makes you seem like you're sitting at a table sharing a drink with Madame Giroux who was um she knew I should say it, who was the proprietress of this particular cafe and um and uh, Van Gogh also painted her as well. You can almost imagine Gauguin's picture is like a cross between the night cafe and, um, and Vincent Van Gogh's uh, portrait here. So, so we have loneliness and isolation and we have a little bit of um, social so, uh, uh, socialness happening over here. All right, so we all know what happens next with Vincent van Gogh, the famous incident of the ear, which is generally understood as a big um, explosive fight between the two artists. Uh, Gauguin flees the house and supposedly Vincent van Gogh takes a straight razor to his ear and cuts off some or perhaps all of it. Their accounts vary wild, wildly in terms of what how much 
is actually cut. And so uh, he afterwards, of course, he produces several self portraits with the bandaged ear. But what most people probably don't know is that the next morning, um, go get well, of course, we know that um, Vincent Van Gogh took whatever part of that ear that he did sever, brought it to a brothel and, and, and sought to give it to um, uh, his favorite prostitute. The next morning he was discovered uh, bloody close to death, but it was Gauguin who went back to the house and found him like that. Um, the authorities were called, Gauguin was actually interviewed and he got on a train that night and the two artists never saw each other again. So in recent years, there's a new theory that's been put forward, which I find very attractive, perhaps just because I'm so sympathetic to Vincent van Gogh. And I see, um, this sort of criminality in, um, and maybe even a sense of guilt in some of, of Paul Gauguin's artwork. So the new theory is that, um, and this is not the one that is widely accepted, I should say, is that uh, Paul Gauguin, who was a master fencer, who actually brought his fencing foils and a sword to Arles um, during this explosive fight, took one of his swords and to Vincent van Gogh, which to me sounds, makes sense because in the history of mental illness, how many other people can you think of who have mutilated their own ear in this way? Um, it's a pretty unusual thing. And then um, Gauguin was known to have described the, the cut with almost a sense of pride. It was like a clean slice, he, he, I think he wrote to several people. So there was, um, like I said, almost a, a sense of pride there. And, and wouldn't it make sense that, that they take this kind of vow of silence to not talk about um, Gauguin's guilt in this, particularly when we know that Vincent van Gogh uh, admired him so much and was struggling in so many other ways. So, um, so like I said, there are a few works that maybe suggest uh, Gauguin's guilt following this incident. In the, in the few months uh, uh, after his um, return to Paris from Arles, he creates uh, some very interesting self-portraits. This one's at the National Gallery in DC. Um, and this one is called St uh, Self-Portrait with a Halo and Snake from 1889. So here's that, that boy who is raised Catholic, um, sort of resurrecting uh, a lot of uh, religious uh, symbolism here. He's brought out the apples, which are a reference, of course, to the Garden of Eden and original sin. He's brought out the snake, which references that as well. He's holding the snake as though he, um, he has been tempted or he is the sinner here, but he has also given himself a halo. Let's not ignore the fact either that he is a disembodied head here with like this almost grotesque expression, this grotesque uh, physiognomy. He's, he's dramatically, um, exaggerated the way he himself looks. Look at, I mean, even just like the, the slope of that, that eyebrow there, there's something really sinister about it. But, um, but the element, or actually the, the, the object that he created that I think really ties a sense of responsibility back to Vincent van Gogh is the ceramic mug over here on the left, which is also included in a painting um, in the year after uh, the incident with Vincent van Gogh. So uh, literally days after he left Arles, uh, Paul Gauguin went to the public execution of a murderer, which uh, was by guillotine, and it did not go very well. I think there was actually an incident with the guillotine. Um, so it was a particularly upsetting public execution to attend, as if they're not all upsetting. But um, but he seems to have created this mug in response to it with, um, with all of the blood at the neck here. He has also sort of suggested blood at the ear that, um, so it's it's almost like tying this idea of somebody who's guilty to, um, to that mutilation of Vincent van Gogh's ear, a sense of responsibility here. And we see that same element coming out um, in, in the painting as well. So <laughs> if all of this had just happened to you, wouldn't you want to get out of town, take a little vacation, escape your problems? Well, that's exactly what uh, Paul Gauguin wanted to do. So uh, he decides to take this first trip to Tahiti because he, it's sort of like a self-imposed exile. Um, it's most oftentimes understood as like his escape from what he views as the corruption of Parisian society, uh, an 
escape from Western civilization. He wanted an unspoiled land. He wanted his own um, perfect Eden, essentially. He, uh, he once said that he had a terrible aching for the unknown, but I think he, knew, he had an expectation of what Tahiti would be. So just to give us a sense in terms of how far of a trip this is, it's pretty unbelievable. Gauguin's travels, we already know he was in, Paris, in France, he was in Denmark, he was in India, he was in Martinique. This was by far the longest shot here. If it was a straight shot, it would have been just 10,000 miles, but it was a journey that actually took longer in totality. It was 69 days. So it was longer than his entire time that he spent with Vincent van Gogh just to get to Tahiti. Um, we'll see later too that he um, spends time on the Marquesas islands too. So um, so here is just about the way he looked during this time. This is an unknown photographer. The photograph is from 1891. Uh, Paul Gauguin sells off a lot of his works in order to fund this trip. And he um, and he said, all the joys, animal and human, of a free life are mine. I have escaped everything that is artificial, conventional, customary. I'm entering into truth and into nature. So the stockbroker, the former stockbroker, wanted nothing to do with middle-class life, really. He was looking for something else. And man, was he in for a disappointment when he got there, because it was like he was kind of forgetting that Tahiti had been colonized already um, by the French, by Catholic missionaries by Protestant missionaries. So, um, so I think he imagined this island paradise where women would be walking around um, wearing next to nothing and they were wearing westernized dresses uh, or Western clothes, I should say. Uh, when he arranged with this particular woman to create a portrait of her, he was so disappointed that she arrived in her Sunday best dress over here. And then over on the right, we have uh, women, uh, uh, I think it's a siesta on the veranda over here. Uh, from 1892. And if you think about it, it's very similar to the kinds of realist paintings that he was exposed to that were painted around 1850. In this case, he just puts um, like a Tahitian overlay on it, you know? Um, and, and he painted this knowing that these paintings would go back to Paris with him and that they would be very attractive to, uh, or had the potential of being very attractive to Parisian buyers because it was familiar subject matter, but it was made exotic by, um, by, by the inclusion of, of Tahitian elements here. So, um, so this is another example of just that um, Paul Gauguin kind of leveraging what his audiences in, in Europe would be familiar with and, um, and presenting it in a beautiful Tahitian package. So this is a picture from 1892 called When Will You Marry? And we've got these uh, striking women in the foreground here. Uh, one of them seems like she's maybe about to stand up or sort of crawl away from uh, the one behind her who has this very serious expression. There's two more figures out in the distance over here. We have um, Gauguin's signature uh, patches of broad, flat color. I particularly love this bluish purple uh, um, shadow in, in the middle ground. We just have the suggestion of the tree up above, but that shadow is just so beautiful. And then so much of this yellow gold. The woman in the foreground seems uncomfortable. She seems like she almost wants to get away from that serious, uh, serious faced person behind her. But the, the title of the picture gives away what, um, what Gauguin is really driving at here. So this idea of when will you marry, this connects it to what was a very popular text um, called The Marriage of Lotti, uh, a man who went from Europe. This was a, a text that was published, uh, I believe in like 18, 1890 or 1881, about a decade before um, Gauguin went to Tahiti himself, but it was a, kind of a, a, an autobiography of a man who goes to, leaves, leaves Europe, goes to Tahiti and finds a wife there. So it was a very romanticized idea of what life was like in Tahiti. So this was Gauguin sort of 
tapping into uh, the public's fascination, romantic fascination of what could happen in Tahiti and, and perhaps exposing uh, his own sources of inspiration for this trip himself. So don't think of his pictures anyway as being like uh, anthropological studies of the people of, of, of Tahiti. Instead, they are sort of calculations in terms of what might appeal to uh, European audiences. So in this case, he's um, using Tahitian models to tell stories of Christianity here. Uh, of course, this would have ruffled a lot of feathers back in Europe. They're very accustomed to seeing, um, let's, uh, well, uh, Mary and the Christ child as white-skinned individuals. So here they are presented as Tahitians. This is a picture that's called Hail Mary, just to give you a sense of its importance in Gauguin's body of work. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was painted in 1891. So so, um, so once again, he's creating something that would be familiar, familiar subject matter for European audiences with um, that's populated with Tahitian characters. We've got our angel who's sort of announcing the birth of, of the Christ child sort of obscured over here on the left. We've got Mary as a Tahitian woman and the Christ child, not in her arms, but leaning, uh, po uh, perched on her shoulder here with his head leaning against hers, very subtle. Um, halos included gorgeous fruit still life in the for in the foreground but then um, two figures who are moving along this path who kind of stop with their hands posed in prayer it reminds me of the breton women once again seeing um an anachronistic religious scene before their eyes and, and their response is to pray. So, um, so Gauguin seems like he's kind of digging into that bag of tricks again. Uh, now, the next story I have to tell you about Gauguin and Tahitian people is, it can be a pretty upsetting story, um, particularly from our frame of re reference today. Paul Gauguin um, had several very young lovers while he was living in the South Pacific. And the first one is um, a girl, a child by the name of Tahanama. And we see her here. She was just 13 years old when he negotiated with her parents and her foster parents um, for her, her marriage to him. So, um, so he did marry a child and then had relationships with other children while he was living in the South Pacific. Uh, but she, I think, preoccupied him during this first stay. Uh, the, the, um, the reference to her parents and grandparents can be also um, an explainer for the title here, which is Tahanama has many parents. In Tahitian society, you would have parents and foster parents. And so he had to negotiate with both of them on the day that he decided to both marry her and actually married her. Um, it all happened very quickly. Uh, within the space of a year of that marriage, Tahanama was pregnant with his child. I believe she's probably pregnant in this picture here, which might explain why she's covering her stomach. And he included, um, the ripe fruit alongside her. But in this case, this picture is once again intended to sell, um, sell us a story about the mystery and um, the mystery of Tahitian uh, culture. He created all of these glyphs in the background, which are are honestly just invented. Like they're they're not a reference to anything. They've never been decoded, but it's sort of a suggestion that she's a part of some kind of mysterious culture here. It's an invention. This is um, a, a deity that's here in the background, um, Haina, who is a goddess of happiness, but he's also included these other figures kind of looming over her shoulder. Her expression is a little bit inscrutable. She's sort of like a Tahitian Mona Lisa here, we can't quite see how she feels. But this next picture, uh, her expression is oftentimes characterized as terrified. This is, I think, his masterwork while uh, during his first visit to Tahiti. This is, um, uh, has a great title, The Spirit of the Dead Watching from 1892. This is in Buffalo at the Albright Knox Gallery. So it's his um, young lover, Tahanama, on a bed, uh, face down. And su supposedly, he, she had just told him about walking walking through the forest and seeing all of these um, 
these sort of like bioluminescent things in the trees that were connected back to Tahitian mythologies and that it terrified her. All of this has turned out to be lies. It's all invented by, um, by Paul Gauguin. Of course, art historians imagine that perhaps the terror on her face, if you read it that way, is really about being with this older man in, in, um, in a bedroom like this. But all of this picture really is, um, is designed to reference back to Western art, in particular, um, Manet's uh, groundbreaking work, Olympia, his revolutionary and very scandalous painting, Olympia from 1893. It's a picture that Paul Gauguin really admired uh, for being so scandalous. He painted his own version of it too. Um, and so in many ways, you can imagine that he decided to create his a Tahitian version of Olympia, a scandalous picture of a young nude woman on a bed. And he's so proud of it, I think, that we see um, uh, another self-portrait, in this case, with uh, the spirit of the dead watching just over his shoulder. He's come a long way from the, uh, the young father who's, you know, hunched over, uh, cold in an attic, hoping for, for freedom here. We've got that same sort of sloping line here, suggesting like the, a, an attic Eve, but he's turned his, his, his head away from the window and he looks out at us with, you know, the chin sort of raised. I always get a sense of arrogance or confidence from, um, from this particular picture here. So he heads back to Paris after two years in, in Tahiti. He's bringing back um, 66 canvases, a number of sculptures that were inspired by like primitive artwork on, um, on the island of Tahiti. And I think he imagined to some degree, he would be returning as like a triumphant hero. Um, but his, his works were really not as successful as he had hoped. So interestingly, while he was in Paris, he continues to make pictures about Tahiti. I oftentimes feel like this is the best picture of Tahiti that he created, and he did it while he was in Paris. It's, um, it's called The Day of the God. It's from 1894. It's at the Art Institute of Chicago. And what always draws me in is like this bottom third of the picture, which almost looks like it could be its own standalone um, abstract painting. We do get a sense that it's water, but we we get sort of like shifting perspectives. We get anti-naturalistic color. It's just, it's beautiful. Um, in the top third of the picture, we have another sculpture or, or idol here. We have women who are making an offering to the idol, someone who's playing music, other women who are dancing, and then in the background figures in the water and on the beach. But our eyes probably go directly to these three figures at the center of the canvas. And they have been loosely interpreted as like birth and life and death over here. Um, the, the greater meaning of this picture eludes us and, um, and Gauguin wanted it to be that way. Um, he didn't think any picture should be too obvious. It should, his pictures and good art, he thought, should sort of leave you searching for more, wondering more. There's a lot going on here that, uh, that opens questions and never entirely closes them. So Paul Gauguin decided that he needed to create or publish a travel journal to help people understand his, his artwork that he produced in, in Tahiti. So he made woodblock prints to go along with this travel journal that's called Noah Noah. You can see here, this is a, a print that's based on this picture. Other prints for uh, the travel journal Noah Noah, I think are consciously designed to suggest that, um, that Tahiti is like the sexual paradise. Uh, so over here, this is a picture called Noah Noah, which re refers to how fragrant the women are. This is women in the river. And this one is called Land of Delights over here. So he's definitely trying to tie into this fantasy that already existed for so many, um, so many Parisians of what Tahiti might be like. He also uh, cultivated sort of a new persona while he was in Paris. He began to hang around with the 
artist Alphonse Mucha, who's sort of best known for his Art Nouveau work um, towards uh, the year 1900. This is Paul Gauguin and Alphonse Mucha over here. You can see that they're they're dressing in sort of outlandish styles, and and um, and Paul Gauguin uh, took the company of a young 14 year old girl whose name was Anna the Javanese. Uh, this is a painting of her from 1893 while they were in Paris. Uh, I believe she was about 14 years old. So conducting this very public affair with a teenager, also at this time a white man with a non-white, uh, um, I believe she was half Indian and half Malaysian, a uh, uh, young person would have caused its own affair too. It's, I think it's a really lovely portrait of her, scandalous of course, because she's so young, um, but I love the red monkey here and the sort of shifting perspective where we see the, we seem to see the chair from uh, straight forward, but we're almost as though we're looking down at her. Um, so we can see he's still an outsider. He's not really fitting in. People aren't really understanding what he's doing. So he does um, what I think anyone would do in this situation. He decides to go back to Tahiti, which is where he felt like, um, he he could he could fit in or at least be understood. Um, he, it was a bitter choice on his end, uh, and he decides to make this trip. And when he leaves Paris for Tahiti for the second time, he would never see Europe again. This is a farewell for forever. Uh, he is living a pretty good life in Tahiti. He this is his home. It was a large home. It was in an affluent area. There's outdoor sculpture. Notice the female nude over here. It included his um, his studio, uh, and these photographs were recently well, they were recently surfaced. I think in about 2016, and they haven't been completely confirmed, but uh, they are believed to be photographs of Paul Gauguin from around the time he uh, returned to Tahiti. We can see that he's like kissing and groping Tahitian women, sort of stacked on top of them. It looks like he's living this frolicking good life for him, um, but we know at this time he was suffering in a number of ways. Um, emotionally, uh, his favorite daughter had died of pneumonia, uh, one of his five kids that he had with his, um, with his wife that he had left. And in addition to that, he had physical maladies that were chronic, that caused chronic pain. Um, he had broken an ankle in a fight and it never healed right. I can imagine that getting around would be pretty painful. He also had chronic conjunctivitis, which sounds awful. And, um, and sores on his skin, which might've been eczema and were probably exacerbated by the fact that he had syphilis too. So, um, so he was feeling uh, pretty bad about himself and then his finances got really bad. Um, he was forced to move from, from that great home that we saw before everything um, was looking awful for him. So he decides to paint his magnum opus basically, and then, um, and then end his life. He, um, he attempted to take his life following this, following uh, the, uh, the completion of this work. He went to the mountains and he swallowed a large dose of arsenic, but in the end he survived. So, um, so he thought that this would be like the perfect bow uh, to wrap up uh, what was his entire life's work. But in the end, uh, um, he would go on. Uh, we are so fortunate because we, this is a work that's in Boston and it's at the, at the Museum of Fine Arts and it's one of his largest, most enigmatic works. It's about 12 feet long and it's called, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? From 1897. And those questions, I mean, those are the big questions, aren't they? Uh, art historians have connected it back to the Catholic liturgy that um, Gauguin would have been studying at, at boarding school, these big kind of driving questions. So you can see a little bit of uh, uh, Catholicism sneaking its way into a picture like this, particularly with this standing figure here who looks like she's plucking fruit. Again, a reference perhaps to the Garden of Eden. Oftentimes this is believed to be a picture that you read from right to left, beginning with uh, birth and ending with old age. 
but most of the rest of the picture is completely enigmatic. It does not seem to answer those big burning questions that he even in inscribes into the picture itself. You can imagine that these could have been questions that were torturing him at this particularly dark moment in his life. It is, um, I, I, it's, I, it's a mysterious work and I think very successful in, in the sense that it does cause you or prompt you to continue looking, to continue to make sense out of it. I think looking at this work is a really kind of satisfying activity because there's so much going on here, but there is no one right way to read it per se. Okay, so um, so he ends up in, you know, he's in financial ruin, he decides to move to the Marquesas Islands, he uh, builds a hut, this is a replica of that hut, and, um, and he called it the house of pleasure. Uh, my, my art history professor in college call, said that he called it the house of the orgasm that definitely got our attention as undergrads. This is the actual lintel um, that's in the Musée d'Orsay uh, that was above the door of, of his house here, which roughly translates to the house of pleasure. <laughs> but inside, he essentially wallpapered the house with pornography. Um, he took the company of more young girls. Um, I believe he impregnated at least one other one. And um, um, and so he was living a, you know, a rather kind of decadent life. He was still producing artwork um, with the intention of creating it for, um, for European audiences. His last self-portrait is this one here. It's very different from anything that we've seen so far. It was actually started by a friend of his, but finished by Paul Gauguin. This is from uh, 1893. And... Um, and, and so we see a very different notion of who he is. He's not trying to tie in like sinner or saint here. It seems like a straightforward depiction of a man who has aged some. He's wearing the spectacles here. We don't necessarily get the sense of, of defeat, but there's resignation. Now, Paul Gauguin was actually taking morphine to deal with all of the, the chronic pain that he had. And so he either had um, an overdose from the morphine in 1903, or he had a heart attack. Um, but he died at the age of 54, very young. Um, and so we, we see that that last self-portrait has taken us far away from the experimental, <laughs> for, from the experimenting that he was doing uh, a decade or so earlier, uh, particularly in regards to how he presented himself, how he thought about himself. Now, uh, burial traditions it, it, on the island were, um, were very quick. He was actually interred. He was put in the ground the next day. His... Um, his, his grave is still there. It's marked by a particular sculpture that he requested. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of works in his home were, were immediately burned because they were thought to be pornography, but whatever could be auctioned off, the money went back to his wife, um, Mette God. Uh, interestingly enough, in the last few years of his life, he did create a, a couple of works about sunflowers that he had, he had specifically requested see, sunflower seeds from a friend planted them and then a year later created these sunflower paintings in response and they seem to suggest that even right at the turn of the century more than a decade after he had spent time with Vincent Van Gogh that he was still thinking about that experience the sunflowers over here on the right seem like a straightforward um, homage to uh, the works that that um, Vincent Van Gogh was painting while they were together in Arles over here on the left it almost seems as though he's taken that that uh sunflower motif and put it in a chair very similar to the chair that uh, Vincent van Gogh had painted for him. You notice in both of these pictures in the background there's a large brown flower with a big seed at the center that seems to be like an all-seeing eye or perhaps a, a sense of consciousness or a, a conscience or guilt <laughs> perhaps even connecting him back to that experience at Arles that he was still clearly thinking about in, in his final years. But to wrap up on Gauguin and his legacy, I can't overstate enough um, how influential he was, how groundbreaking his work is. Um, 
paintings like Yellow Christ paved the way for the work that uh, Matisse was doing in the first few years of the 20th century. Even Matisse's work was still reviled when he first painted it, but uh, because people had never really seen anything like it, uh, the only thing like it was really what, uh, what Gauguin was doing. And so I think if you look at the use of color, if you look at the use of line, um, he's paving the way for expressionism. And, um, and uh, well, he liberated color, I should say, for, for Henri Matisse. And I think you can especially see that in this comparison here with the Day of the God and these beautiful kind of twisting, undulating lines, the pinks and the purples integrated into the setting. And then it's as though uh, Matisse lifts them and puts them into this Arcadian forest. I would say that Gauguin also influenced Cubism too. His interest in non-Western sculpture was exactly um, the same interest that, that uh, Pablo Picasso had after the turn of the century. And that interest in the sculpture uh, prompted Pablo Picasso to start deconstructing the face and flattening the face and start uh, and, and innovate the new movement of Cubism. So, uh, so it's as though, Gauguin set the stage for both major threads of, of, um, of modernism in the 20th century. In recent years, his paintings have sold at auction for astronomical sums. This is a painting called Maternity II from 1899. In 2004, it sold for about $40 million. Uh, when Will You Marry, which we saw earlier, sold in 2014 for $210 million. So clearly people who know a lot about art <laughs> know that Paul Gauguin's work is, um, is enormously important in the storyline of what happened in the 19th into the 20th century. So we'll wrap up thinking about everything we learned about Paul Gauguin, everything that he's told himself about us. We've got another self-portrait here uh, with a palette from 1894. We've had the chance to meet him. We've seen everything that he painted most everything that he's painted. And we've seen the major factors that influenced his artistic decisions. Now, when I was putting this program together, a friend of mine said, don't do Paul Gauguin. I just hate Paul Gauguin. And there's a lot about him that is hard to swallow. But I think on some level, most of us could probably um, empathize with the feeling of being an outsider um, or perhaps maybe his wanderlust. But, um, but it is tough to reconcile any of that empathy that we have with uh, the outsized ego, the sense that he was a martyr and a devil and you know, there's so many tough parts of his biography. So I hope the big takeaway today is, his, uh, is that he was an artist that had this tremendous artistic vision. And I think we wouldn't have had all of the innovation that we saw in the 20th century without Paul Gauguin paving the way. So I will end there for now and I welcome any questions or comments. I see that there's a few in the chat. I'll start going through them. Somebody asked, Connie asked, is, um, is the large number of self-portraits unusual for a painter, self-absorbed perhaps? I think that's an easy way to think of it. Um, we know that he painted about 40 self-portraits during his lifetime, which does, it, it's definitely on the high end, but if you're a broke artist, it's, a, it's, an, it's an affordable subject. <laughs> Let's see here. How big is When Will You Marry? That is a good question. I'm not sure if I have that in my notes. I apologize, but that's a very good question. <laughs> Rosamond, I agree with your assessment. He sounds like a horrible person who'd be thrown in jail if he was alive today. Um, I agree. <laughs> was there ever a discussion of paint poisoning? How many times was he married? How many kids did he have? Okay, so the paint poisoning, I'm not sure if the question was in reference to taking of arsenic, um, but I believe there, was, uh, there were letters written that indicated that he was trying to end his life. 
uh, how many times was he married? Officially two, but I believe in total um, to Metigat and then to, to, to Hanama. But I believe uh, on the second uh, trip to the South Pacific, there were two more girls that he did not officially marry. There were multiple children who were produced from his relationships in um, in Tahiti. I, I know for certain at least two children. So at least seven children total, five with his first wife, um, one with Tahanama, I believe, and one with another child. Um, and so his descendants, uh, I believe some of his descendants still live in Tahiti today. Did he keep in contact with his children? I'm not sure if he kept in close contact with them. There was um, other sort of fragments of, of biography that I read here and there. One of them stated that he was writing a letter to a friend and he was like griping about um, hospital bills and you know, hospital costs. And it wasn't even until the second paragraph that he noted that one of his um, first five children from the first marriage had fallen out of like a three-story window. He didn't lead with that. He he led with the griping of the, of the hospital bills. So it doesn't seem like there was a real closeness. There was also a lot of reference to his favorite children. Um, he had two favorite children out of the five. So he, it doesn't sound like he was necessarily a doting father. Why are there so many Gauguin paintings in Buffalo, Judy? That's a really good question. I did not dive into that, but I wonder if they were good friends with the collector who bequeathed it, or if they just decided they wanted to be like a, a, a Gauguin center in, um, in, in America. That, that's worth exploring. That's a very good question. Um, oh, yes. And then uh, let's see. I was thinking that his behavior might be related to the contaminants in the paint. That's an interesting question, Donna. I, I, and I'm not sure if that's been explored before. Um, we know that uh, uh, Vincent van Gogh ingested some of his paints and paint thinner. And I think, you know, um, artists were fairly accustomed to, you know, licking a brush as they needed to, but I would say his behavior was so far outside of, um, of the behavior of most other artists that he was, um, a contemporary with that I, I I'm not sure I would I mean without any any research on it my hunch is that it's not necessarily related to um to paint poisoning but it's an interesting line of inquiry and I wouldn't rule it out completely Beverly thanks for your comment connecting uh the painting of the Breton women uh dancing like the three graces that's wonderful um how long before his art became popular that's a good question. I would say um, it sort of seems to be, I, I, well, popular is, is a tricky term. How long before it started selling well? I don't have a firm answer <laughs> for that one. It's interesting because I think like as his, um, as his star rises in the art market, um, it's, it's gone down with the public because I think the more you learn about him, the, the harder it is to like him. <laughs> so, um, so, so I don't know if, it, if this is sort of like a tipping point moment, but, but, um, but that's a good question. That, that's one that I would probably have to go back and explore, but it seems like it's, it's, at a, it's at a peak right now. And thanks for your kind words. Let's see. Donna, I really like that you're, um, the, uh, the, this conversation about the, the paint ingesting. So I'll have to go back and explore that. It's fascinating. So I'm sorry, I don't feel like I had great answers to a lot of these, <laughs> these, these questions, but you've all prompted really, really good um, questions here, which I might have to go back and look at. And then Toby asked, um, was he affected by Van Gogh's death? I mean, my, re my reading, and it's really based on, um, uh, on that new theory that perhaps he was the person that had cut um, Vincent Van Gogh's ear was that it seems like there's a sense of responsibility there from um, from the paintings that he was creating later on. Uh, it seems as though Vincent van Gogh sort of drove him a little bit crazy while they were together. Apparently, Vincent van Gogh could just start talking and not stop. <laughs> so you can imagine what it would be like if you were living in close quarters with someone who didn't have like a pause button. <laughs> um, so I think I think it was a complicated relationship, but his paintings would seem to suggest that um, that there was remorse or sadness that it, that their relationship seemed to end the way it did. Yeah. 
I think that's all the questions. You did a great job of going through them all. Did you answer the one? Uh, Debbie had a question about how many paintings did he sell in his lifetime? Where did you answer that one already? Oh, I didn't. Um, you I'm talked not, about popularity. No. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I don't have a firm number for you on that, but I will say his works did, did not sell as well as he'd hoped when he first came back to Tahiti or back to Paris from Tahiti. And he had a few friends. He actually, um, Edgar Degas, the impressionist was somebody who like stuck by his, his side. A few of his friends did that, but e even by the time he came, that, uh, came back from Tahiti, it was as though he was like a stranger in a strange land. I, I think he'd alienated almost everybody. People weren't really sticking by his side. So, um, so I don't think that his his sales were super successful. And then um, it was almost like a fire sale to get rid of some pictures to fund the trip, that last trip back. So th they were selling. And of course, when, when Vincent Van Gogh's art dealer brother first saw him, he was really taken with them. But by the end, um, it, it's, it seems to be like a mismatch between, uh, in terms of what he was painting and what uh, the audiences wanted. So that's an, it's an interesting question. And now I have to go back and sort of find out when there was like this resurgence of interest in him. I'm also very curious to know if he started painting these um, references, these homages to Vincent Van Gogh, if, if Vincent Van Gogh's star was on the rise and he wanted to kind of <laughs> um, jump on, jump on the band wagon. And yes, I thank you uh, uh, for tying it back to that comment from his mother that it looks like um, that he that he could alienate it, everybody and wind up all by himself. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, Elaine was asking about books at the library. I will certainly go through our collection here and include a list with the recording when I send it out. Um, I'm also going to attach this chat to, to, the, um, to the email that I send out so that everyone can go back through the questions that were asked and answers that were given. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming online with us today. Um, this was a really great presentation. I really enjoyed listening to it too. Um, and thank you so much, Jane, for your time and your work. And we look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. You can register for that on our calendar. And that's gonna be on Faith Ringgold, Quilts, Painting and Politics. So another really interesting topic. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Okay, bye now.